Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. My name is David McGee, and I'm a professor in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. And um, together with my colleague, Jeremiah Johnson from the Department of Chemistry, uh, I just wanna welcome you, and we're both gonna share a little bit about our research, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so in EAPS, or course 12, as it's known, there's a huge amount of work being done to understand the path in front of us to examine the stability of polar ice sheets, to understand how hurricanes will respond in a warmer world, to examine the vulnerability of marine ecosystems to threshold-like changes. Um, this and a huge variety of other work uses observations, sophisticated computation, and elegant theory to try to understand the mechanisms of climate change and to predict the magnitude and the pace of the impacts that we're likely to experience. My group focuses on the question of water availability and specifically water availability in the subtropical dry regions, places like the Western United States, the Central Andes in South America, Northern and Southern Africa. But instead of primarily looking forward, most of our gaze is directed backward um, towards the natural climate changes that have occurred over Earth's four and a half billion year history. Our focus is actually a little bit narrower than that. We focus just on the last 500,000 years, so like the last one ten thousandth of Earth history. And the motivation for doing this is that though we have these elegant theories and precise observations of the modern climate and wonderful uh, climate models, Earth's climate system remains an incredibly complex system. And one way of testing the theories and the models that we use to predict the future is by ground truthing them against the natural experiments that the Earth, the Earth system has gone through in the past. Now, our work does not treat any past climate as an analog for where we're headed in the 21st century. Rather, it uses these as well-constrained natural experiments with this complex system where we can, we, we know pretty well what the forcings were, how the system was kicked, and we can examine using geological archives how it responded. This is a set of climate records from the last 500,000 years showing the Earth going in and out of ice ages. This CO2 in red goes up and down, and these geochemically based estimates of Antarctic temperature go up and down with them. Um, to read this record, of course, requires using geological deposits that archive information about the climate around them as they form. So one example are these uh, calcium carbonate lake deposits in Northern Chile that my former student, Christine Chen, is studying. So remnants of a much wetter condition in this region in the past. Another example are stalagmites in caves in Northeastern Mexico that uh, another former student, Gabriela Serrato Marx, uh, is, is studying here, actually collecting some drip waters to understand how the, how the modern system um, filters information about the climate above the cave uh, to form stalagmites. Sometimes we don't have land-based deposits, and so we need to look at archives preserved in deep sea sediments. And here is a postdoctoral researcher, Christopher Kinsley, on the board a drilling ship where they are drilling down into deep sea sediments to look at archives of windblown dust coming out of the world's dry lands. Now, this is what fills our Instagram feed, but of course, most of the work is back in the lab, trying to figure out how to tell climate history from mud and rock. And here, the primary tools that we use are uh, uranium and its decay products, so thorium and protactinium isotopes. Through careful clean lab chemistry and the use of this mass spectrometer and other instruments, we can use these isotopes and their well-known decay schemes to tell time. And the key thing about determining the age of these deposits precisely is to be able to place the climate changes that we're looking at, the, sorry, the, the water availability changes that we're looking at in a temporal context and map past precipitation patterns through space and time and relate the responses that we see to the well-known histories of um, past changes in climate forcings. One of the places where our work particularly focuses is in the Western United States, where as you can see from this picture, most of the valleys are dry today. Uh, so for example, the Bonneville Salt Flats were my opening slide that that picture was taken. 
This is a region that is projected to, to be subject to increasing water stress in coming decades, increased above what is already a high level of water stress. And so there's a great need to make sure that the projections that underlie projections like these, uh, that the climate model projections are, are accurate, that the models are behaving well. All around this region, though it's dry today, there's remnants of very large changes in water availability in the past. So this is a picture from northern Utah showing these three benches carved by ancient lakes in the past. Similarly, this, there's this bathtub ring extending around the basin about a thousand feet above the modern um, Great Salt Lake. Putting these and other shoreline deposits around the Great Basin together, we see remnants of large lakes extending from Death Valley in the south to Lake Bonneville in the north, which was about the size of modern day Lake Michigan, and then west to the Lahontan Basin and other basins in southeastern Oregon and northern California. The key thing about dating these deposits very accurately is that then we can compare these responses in these lake systems to what was going on in Earth's climate uh, around the world. Shown here are records from the last period of sustained global warming during the end of the last ice age between 20 and 10,000 years ago. So the, in the blue is a proxy record, a compilation of geochemically based estimates of Earth's surface temperature um, from around the world. And then in red are reconstructions of atmospheric CO2 levels from Antarctic ice. The really interesting thing is that the period in the past when global temperatures were the most different from present, that is centered around 20,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, is not the period when we see that precipitation patterns were the most different from today. Rather, in the Western United States, for example, the greatest lake levels are during this 3,000 year interval between about 18 and 15,000 years ago. So these lakes would have been there right around the same time that the first humans were coming in to, into the Americas. So why did these lakes appear not during the, the time when the temperature was the most different, but rather during the beginning of this period of global warming at the end of the last ice age? Well, we think the key instead is not so much with global temperature, but changes in temperature gradients. So this is, again, these surface temperature reconstructions, but instead of looking at mean global temperature, we're looking at the temperature difference between temperatures in the Northern hemisphere minus those in the South. And we see this extended period of relative cooling of the northern hemisphere as this period of global warming began, where the northern hemisphere cooled dramatically with respect to the south due to disruptions of ocean circulation that reduced heat transport across the equator from the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere. And so, and this is actually reproduced all around the world, that in the Asian monsoon region, in North Africa, South Africa, and the central Andes, this period from about 18,000 to 15,000 years ago is a period of remarkable uh, precipitation anomalies. And so a very general takeaway from this is that past precipitation changes track changes in inner hemispheric temperature gradients more closely than they do mean global temperature. And we think this is because these temperature gradients are really what determines how winds move around the earth and how they move precipitation around the earth. But the importance for future climate, of course, is that we primarily usually think about mean global temperature going forward, but just as important as that is going to be how the Earth's climate system uh, distributes heat between the hemispheres, which is a much more subtle point for climate models to get right. We can also get more quantitative than that kind of general statement and look at, uh, compare these um, lake-based records, these geological indications of past precipitation changes against climate model output. And the neat thing here is we can take the same climate models that we use to project the future, take them out of their comfort zone of their calibration data sets of the 20th century and early 21st century, back to these paleoclimate scenarios. And what we see in, use, in looking at this is that most climate models underestimate the magnitude of past precipitation changes in the Western United States. And this we've, we've been able to track this down to reflecting biases in their representation of the tropical Pacific Ocean. And so this, and, and carrying this forward, it suggests that these models may be too stable in terms of the, the precipitation changes that they project. So it, just to close, the main thing that our group does in general is to make data, robust data-based inferences about past climates and then confront our expectations about climate change based on theory and models with those data and engage in this rich conversation between the two. 
Lastly, I just want to close by saying that one of the other hats that I wear at MIT is as the director of a first year learning community called Terrascope that engages first year undergraduates uh, in project based classes and in field experiences in which they get to look at complex interdisciplinary sustainability related challenges really firsthand and see how science and technological expertise really has to be placed in the context of local cultures and history and policy and economics in order to be effective. And so it's a great way of their seeing very early on in their time at MIT how their science and engineering know-how uh, can get applied in the real world. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeremiah. All right. Thank you very much, David. And good evening, everyone. It's a um, great honor to have the opportunity to tell you about uh, some of the work that's been going on in my group in the Department of Chemistry here at MIT, where we are uh, trying to develop new methods to improve the sustainability of um, certain types of plastics that are traditionally very challenging to recycle and reuse. So I'm sure many of you have heard or seen or read alarming statistics about plastics accumulation in the environment. One of them that uh, I find particularly troubling uh, showed here by 2050, it's projected that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by mass. And I think we would all like to avoid that scenario. Um, and one um, obvious way to do that would be to reuse and recycle plastics uh, more frequently. And um, fortunately, many of the most commonly used plastics, such as polyethylene and polypropylene and many others, are inherently recyclable. Their chemical and physical nature allows them to be recycled. These are plastics called thermoplastics. Nevertheless, still a relatively small fraction of these plastics are recycled, only about 20% worldwide, uh, less than 10% in the United States. Um, but there's a, a whole other set of plastics called thermoset plastics that by their very nature, their chemical and physical nature, they cannot be readily degraded or recycled. And indeed, um, they are almost exclusively ending up in landfills or incinerated at end of life. And, and nevertheless, these thermosets are critically important to a number of um, existing and next generation technologies, such as in the automobile industry, for example, car tires and panels, bumpers and things of that nature are all thermosets. Um, uh, aerospace industry widely uses these the electronics and infrastructure industries, and ironically, even renewable uh, energy. So for example, the uh, blades on, on windmills that are used to harvest renewable energy are made from thermosets that at the end of their life end up in landfills. And so in the future where perhaps we as a society adopt broader recycling uh, uh, tools and, and plans and policies uh, that will allow us to recycle thermosets plastics, we'll still be left with nearly 20% of materials that we can't yet recycle. And so in my laboratory, we are trying to develop chemistry that will enable the selective disassembly of thermoset polymer networks or plastics into valuable new and recyclable products. And so the question we wanted to address was how can we design these sorts of materials to degrade when they're inherently resistant to such degradation? And we thought we would tackle that challenge with um, one of the, what would be a, a particularly difficult material to work with, because if we could do it with that, we could do it with many other things. And that material is uh, a material called polydicyclopentadiene uh, or PDCP. PDCPD is a commercial high performance thermoset often used in the automobile industry. Um, it is, has outstanding thermal and chemical stability, durability, it's lightweight, it's tough, has exceptional ballistic impact resistance, but it's not degradable, nor is it recyclable. And that is because of its chemical composition. PDCPD is made through a reaction called ring opening metathesis polymerization using a monomer called dicyclopentadiene to form a network structure comprising connections between strands we call crosslinks and linear polymer strands. And you can see from this structure that this material is made entirely from carbon and hydrogen atoms and all of those are covalently bonded, forming a very robust, uh, stable network, yet one that is inherently challenging to degrade. So over the last couple of years, my laboratory has been developing ways to make this material degradable. And last year, we uh, reported on the design of these cyclic molecules that have oxygen, silicon, oxygen groups called silo ethers embedded within them. And we can tune the reactivity and the degradability of these silo ethers by changing the nature of the chemical 
uh, substituents attached, attached onto the silicon atom. By simply mixing this molecule in with dicyclopentadiene during a traditional curing process, we can now generate polydicyclopentadiene samples that have these oxygen silicon oxygen linkages embedded within their strands. And we know from other developments in the field of organic chemistry that oxygen silicon bonds can be selectively cleaved under very mild conditions using a variety of different reagents. So the question that Peyton Shea, a postdoctoral uh, uh, scholar in my laboratory, set out to answer was, could we enable degradability of polydicyclopentadiene using these molecules? And indeed, he found that low numbers of cleavable bonds, importantly, put in the right place, enable PDCD degradation. So to show you the kinds of experiments that he does, he would synthesize, for example, virgin PDCPD, so not adding any of our molecule, and then adding five, 10, or 15% of one of our molecules that has isopropyl groups attached to the silicon. And now he exposes these materials to fluoride ions, the same types of ions that are in your toothpaste and a many other household chemicals. And we know that fluoride can very selectively and mildly cleave those silicon oxygen bonds without touching any other part of the chemistry of the network. And by doing this, Peyton made a remarkable discovery, which is that, of course, 0% of our molecule, so virgin PDCB, doesn't degrade at all. So this is looking at the percentage of initial mass recovered after treatment with this fluoride solution. It doesn't degrade at all. If we just add 2.5% of his molecule, it doesn't degrade much either. But at 5% and then at 7.5%, we see complete dissolution of this material um, uh, under these very mild conditions. So now we have a way to make polydicyclopentadiene degradable. One obvious question is, does that maintain the useful properties of polydicyclopentadiene? Because if not, it wouldn't be a very valuable technology. And all of the data shown on this slide, which I won't walk you through, confirm that low numbers of cleavable bonds do not hurt the useful properties of PDCPD. For example, stiffness, strain at break, thermal stability, ballistic impact resistance, they're all the same but we've added the feature of degradability. And this is all made possible by this low number of these monomers that we need to add into the material. So now I've shown you that we can take a sample of this plastic, which has a schematic structure like this, where the silo ether monomer we add are these yellow spheres. These would be the cleavable bonds in the network. And I've shown you that we can mildly cleave these to generate degradation products that are monomeric or oligomeric fragments. Here's a picture of a, a beaker filled with these. We can, we can use these, they're easy to weigh out, easy to handle powders. And we know their chemical composition because of how selective our degradation process is. We can simply take these materials and re-crosslink them under the same conditions used to make polydicyclopentadiene to generate recycled samples that have equivalent stress strain behavior, i.e. mechanical properties compared to the virgin PDCPD. Moreover, in the, in the thermosets field, many materials are used as composites where they are filled with things like carbon fibers, graphite, silica, to improve their mechanical properties even further. Sometimes, for example, in the case of carbon fiber, the carbon fiber is more valuable, um, less sustainable than even the plastic that it is embedded in. So you would really like to be able to recover that. Here, Peyton showed that he could make composites by embedding carbon fibers into PDCPD and then using our very mild conditions for dissolution of the plastic matrix, he recover this fiber for reuse again and also recover the plastic for recycling. So with that, I'll close by just mentioning that this cleavable strand approach is a low cost general way to enable thermoset recycling. And it's really enabled by molecular level control of these complex polymer networks. So with that, I'd like to thank my research group, the folks who did this work, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and the Deshpande Center for Technological Innovation for support. And we'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. So I see a question to me, to me in the chat. It says, it says, Jeremiah, how long would it take to get this technology out of the academic lab into an automobile factory? Um, it, it wouldn't take us very long. It would take us about as long as it takes us to ship um, a, a kilogram of the monomer to your automobile factory. In fact, we can already make this or obtain this molecule on kilogram scale, and we are already collaborating with the, ma the major manufacturers of polydicyclopentadiene to start to explore um, 
using this in their formulations. A key advantage of this approach is that it doesn't require any change to a manufacturer's protocol for making their materials. That's often a roadblock in other sort of new material technologies. They just need to add in seven and a half to 10 percent by volume of our molecule into what they already do, and they can make their material degradable. So we're actually already doing that, and I hope to have good results soon. Um, there's a question for me about a lot of you know our work. A lot of our work has been in the in the southwestern United States. Um, is there a next region or, or for field work or data collection where you'd like to focus on and why? Um, so there's a, there's so many regions that where where we really have a very minimal observational record of precipitation changes. Maybe just going back a decade or or, or more, we have very limited ability to understand the natural variability of climate change and to calibrate the models that we use to project the future. So one, one place where we're working right now is partnering with um, researchers and graduate students at the University of Antananarivo um, to examine and build out uh, records of past precipitation in uh, changes in Madagascar, which is a region where there's a great dependence on rain-fed ag agriculture. And so uh, that's, that's a really exciting project going forward. So I, I got a I got a an interesting question I've never been asked before, but I really like it, which is, what happens if if someone spills toothpaste on their car? Will their car just dissolve away if they're using the material? And and I have to say, most likely not. Um, the degradation reaction not only requires fluoride, but it requires a little bit of a solvent to help the network kind of swell up. These are really hard plastics that things don't penetrate very well into, which is why they're so stable for so long. Um, but you know, spilling some fluoride on your car, if you just wipe it off, your car is going to be just fine. So um, thank you for that question. That was fun. So we are receiving a signal that this session is ending now. So again, I would like to thank all of you for a thing and um, yeah, have a great rest of your evening. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you so much.